Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kathleen. I am a junior at the University of Michigan studying lighting design, um, education, and art history. Uh, hey, folks and thumb. Um, my name is Mayna, and I'm a grad student at the university studying um, ethnomusicology, which no one's heard about. So it's a combination of music and anthropology, um, real nerdy humanities stuff. But yeah, it's nice to kind of virtually do. And hey friends, this is Tsuk Hai. I'm currently a freshman at LSA, hoping to, to study psychology and drama. And I'm currently studying remotely from China. So I really hope I get to get, meet you guys in person this coming fall. Um, and our workshop group, some of the other facilitators in it were um, Josh, Pat, and Sarah. Um, and unfortunately, they, they had some things come up and can't be in this final video. Um, but we're super excited to share all of our favorite stories and um, things that you wrote back to us with you and with everybody watching on the YouTube page. Um, and the stories that are in our, in our video that we are sharing are created by Chris, Elijah, Bonza, Jerry, Martin, and Robert or Bobby. Um, and they are all at the Thumb Correctional Facility in Michigan. Uh, so first, we're gonna share some of the stories um, that you, were, you wrote to us about what theater means to you guys. Um, and our first story is from Chris. Um, he says, I had the opportunity to be a part of two theater productions in prison. One was a PCAP drama class in 2010. The other one was one the then chaplain organized in 2011 around a book that was donated en masse by the Detroit Public Library to youthful offenders. Both made me see that theater is a celebration or a reckoning with life itself, as, as, as is all storytelling. But to do so, theater follows life in celebrating it in, um, but to do so, theater follows life in doing it live. What better way to experience it for anyone, but especially for those whose lives are so otherwise muted, lifeless, drab? I'm in awe of good storytelling and so much more so by the living nature of theater. I want to learn more, understand more about theater. I'm really looking forward to this workshop for this reason. I feel like by teaching how and allowing prisoner actors to see themselves in different roles in different plays, it teaches the ability to see uh, themselves in different roles in life. These different roles can lead to more empathy and the ability to see oneself in a different lifestyle. Changing an entire mindset and lifestyle after decades isn't as simple as it sounds, but by seeing oneself in it, you can see what's necessary and what might be worth investigating, investing in to make that positive change. I think the public perception of prisoners is that they're less than human, being dehumanized, the prisons and those inside are often ignored. At the same time, the public has an odd fascination with both stories of hardship in general and with crime. If stories, the often heartbreaking tragedies that often go with the stories of those inside come from more than the first one, and if these emotions not the end results of the crime. Our next response comes from Fonza, and he said, I'm hoping that theater arrives within the prison because it allows many of my counterparts to reveal to revel in their hidden talents as well as discover their worth as men and women. Many years ago, the MDOC had a program that brought theater within the prison, which I was a part of. It was a play titled God's Favorite, a Neil Simon play. The experience was mind-boggling. It allowed the prisoners to gain self-worth and a better appreciation of something new. Regardless of the good or grandeur that theater brings the facilities, uh, this facilities will always have issue with such a program. I was at a facility that had such a program and we performed several plays for the staff and population. It was great because we were viewed as people and not cons. This was one of the happiest moments as a prisoner because I was afforded the opportunity to have a discussion with various people. Unfortunately, this program was short-lived. And Jerry has something to share as well. To be honest, I knew absolutely nothing about theater, though I am looking forward to learning all I can about it. Over the years, I have always kept up with Ashley's travel and trips inside prisons in places like Brazil, 
through the PCAP newsletter. But as far as Syria in prisons and why it might be happening all over the world, I can only make a guess. Prisons are lonely places with very little to do and very little change. Think Groundhog Day, but with steel and concrete and uncaring people. So imagine theater as a wonderful way to live another life, kind of like the way I live life through my fictional characters. When they cry, I cry. When they laugh, I laugh. I imagine theater is something like that. As a writer, I love experiencing life through the eyes of my characters. So taking that process one step further and attempting to be one of my characters or anyone's characters really interests and excites me. For people on the outside, I think the best way to spread what goes on inside prison is by first making friends with men and women in prison, then actually believing them when they tell you what's taking place inside, no matter how crazy it sounds. Then take that info and blast it out to the world on your social media platforms. People inside prisons need to make more friends with free people like any way they can and explain to them how the system works, convince them to spread the word. We need to become stronger voices. Every chance I get, I publish something about life inside prison. No matter what the editor is asking for, I write it. Words are power. I try to teach as many convicts as I can how to write, then I point them in the direction of places willing to publish them. Together, we will break the chains. I agree. The state's regulation of people getting together in prison does keep us from forming community bonds, but they do this intentionally. They will say it is to stop gangs, but what it is really about is keeping us divided. The states can't help but look at everything through an us versus them lens. And following that logic, there are way more prisoners than state employees, so they employ divide and conquer techniques. What I have been trying to impart to both sides for years is the fact that this attitude is what turns most convicts against the government. That's one of the major reasons most convicts leave prison angry and bitter because the opposing side mistreated them for years and years. But if we look at things like we were all a part of the same whole as if there were no op opposing sides, then we could build bonds, rehab rehabilitate, and grow to be good men who want to return to a society where we feel a part of. Um, our next response is from Elijah. Um, and Elijah says, I believe that theater is happening in many prisons because it not only gives the inmates a way to express themselves nonviolently, but also begins to give them knowledge on how to deal with emotions in the future and express them in a healthy way instead of bottling them up and letting it affect them in a negative way. My understanding of theater is mostly what TV shows make fun of, but I'm hoping to see the greater part of it. Theater excites me because it's to me a professional role playing, but with more emotion and feeling when it comes to the background. I kind of expect this experience here is to help me put more emotion into things. Our next response is from Bobby. And he said, I believe that theater might be happening all over the world because there exists a need to express oneself that doesn't go away with or upon incarceration. There also exists a need for alternative methods of rehabilitation within these penal systems, and theater would provide such a method as it allows for a prison to explore their creativity in a constructive way. Furthermore, it allows men and women who may not have experienced much positive affirmation to see the fruits of effort and hard work. To me, theater means all of the above. It is also a medium to entertain others. I expect theater to provide a creative outlet for me. Theater, I anticipate, will give me the outlet to establish relevant characters, tell their story, evolve them, and make them captivate into the potential audience. My understanding is of it being a dramatic performance. Theater excites me because it is boundless, limitless in the production that can be envisioned, created, and performed. I believe that theater can shift the boundaries within a prison setting because creating the theatrical performance requires one to imagine a life, a time, an instance, a place, a conversation, dialogue, a scenario, etc., that exist outside of the bounds and limits of this environment. It frees a person mentally and emotionally, where prison, by nature, binds and stagnates. 
I believe that performance can offer the power of confidence and belief in self to the incarcerated. It will allow us to do something that is positive and selfless. It transforms us from takers to givers. And finally, let's look at what theater means to Martin. I believe that theater is found in prison because it is a vent for stifled creative energy. Men and women are given the freedom to become someone other than the person they are, the one who, get, who got some, themselves in this mess. Many prisoners suffer from low self-esteem, myself included. Some masks, some mask it by a false bravado or maschimo. Others wallow, it, wallow in it, retreating into a reclusive shell of depression, and still others exhibit it, exhibit it in the form of misplaced anger or aggression. These all have a creative energy behind them, waiting to be unleashed in a positive and productive way. Theater, as well as other arts, provides such a positive venting value for those creative energies. To me, theater provides a certain freedom to do and say things that I might not normally do or say, depending upon the characters who I am portraying. I do, however, have one issue which might hinder or limit my ability to portray certain types of characters. My relation with God, as my father, prohibits my heart from saying anything or acting in such a way which might dishonor him. So cousin is off the table for me. Sort of limits my role, doesn't it? And the next few section stop selections that we're going to read are from um, responses to one of our um, connect prompts, which are kind of just helping us learn more about um, the people in our workshop, you guys, and um, helping you connect with one another as well. So this first prompt um, was we asked them to tell us something that we would never be able to guess by looking at them. Um, and so our first response is from Chris, um, and he wrote a poem, which I will try to do justice, but I am not good at reading poetry. Um, were my mouth known more for my words than for how well my girlfriend says I am with a kiss, verbal equivalent of Muhammad Ali with his fists, instead of a stammering like a monkey paw twisted a wish, were I a lyrical champion instead of a stuttering mess, debate team gentleman who can fight to the death, instead of a muttering mutterer muttering under his breath. Um, and he added a note to let us know that when he's mentally taxed, he has a mild stutter that comes out. Yeah, the next one um, comes from Jerry, who starts off saying, something uh, no one would be able to guess by looking at me. Hmm, let me see. I look like your typical white prisoner, shaved head, beard, tattoos. The movies would lead you to believe I am a racist, drug addled sociopath, but the truth is I'm none of those things at heart. I'm an artist, a writer, and a poet. And he typed, lol, <laughs> I do not look like any of these. And the next one is from Bobby. Look at me. No one would be able to guess that I am a computer geek who has always felt awkward in social settings because I don't like the attention that my height has always drawn to me. Hmm. Um, and Martin shared with us, I suppose, given stereotypes common in prison, the things most who don't know me would not soon guess about me is my love of contemporary jazz and jazz fusion music and smooth jazz too. I'm a white guy who usually shaves his head bald in the summer. I wear a small goatee, so first impressions produce the skinhead metalhead stereotype. They're quite surprised when I bring my keyboard out to the yard and play jazz or black gospel or urban contemporary gospel music. Now, after 34 years in prison, I have many jazz aficionados wanting to borrow my media player or cassette player or MP3 player or my music sheets for certain songs. Um, and then our next one comes from Elijah, who said, well, one thing people wouldn't be able to tell about me by looking at me um, would be I'm a cancer, the astrological sign. Well, the next part is about our heroes. And our first response comes from Chris. <clears throat> he writes, my hero is in so many ways is my dad. This wasn't always the case. When I was little, I was often frustrated that my dad acted different and distant at times. 
something I couldn't process. Later, I learned that he was he has mild Asperger's. Today, I look back and see how he has given his all to be the best father he could be. Even when he's struggled with things, he put twice as much effort because of his love than anyone else did. And the person I am today appreciates this so much more for that fact. Um, Jerry shared with us, um, who is my hero and why? The late great author, Robert Jordan. I taught myself how to write by using his real of time fantasy books as reference books. Whenever I was stuck and couldn't figure out how something worked, whether it be grammar, sentence structure for pacing, or whatever, I would crawl through his books until I found the way he approached the same problem, and then I would copy his style. He was my mentor, writing guru, and teacher all rolled into one. Uh, our next response comes from Elijah, who states, My hero would have to be my mom because she's always been there for me, and she'll always continue to be there for me. And the next one is from Martin. Sally is my number two hero, second only to Jesus Christ. She endured the torture of life as a functionally single mom, working at McDonald's and putting herself through college, raising our four kids and bringing them to visit me at the various prisons until it became too much. After 23 years of a semi-prison existence, and she finally divorced me in 2009 cutting off all communications. I have a sense of obligation to her at all, almost every level to ensure that I aid her in her later years with some income generating stocks. So the next portion of responses that we are gonna share are responses to the create prompts that we sent in. Um, which a lot of them were kind of like story prompts or acting exercise prompts and things like that. Um, so these stories are in response to those. And um, we, some of them will be acting out a little bit. Some of them are more narrative stories. So uh, yeah, we hope you enjoy them. Um, I can, I can explain the, the first one. The first one we um, have is by Chris. Um, which um, we've titled uh, Fine Dining. Um, and uh, it has an interesting kind of reveal at the end. I hope you enjoy. So nice to see you again. She says, wearing her designer heels, towering over the other seated customers, she sets down her Louis Vuitton handbag as she reaches across the table to listlessly shake the lawyer's hand. I'm glad we could get together on such short notice, responds the lawyer as he takes her hand, the pinstripe sleeve sliding up his French cuff-covered forearm. He had enjoyed many fine restaurants, but never the Bourdain here in New York. Elegant, the crystal above their heads reflected just enough light as though it was designed specifically for this time, this moment of the day. All around them, faces they did not know but recognized from TV, from advertisements, from legends that bordered on city mythology. This is where the modern aristocracy met. The lawyer felt both at home and simultaneously out of place here. Here were his people, yet he wouldn't have gotten in if not for his client's name. The waitress arrived quickly, a young but exceptionally pretty girl. Um, Get me something with alcohol, your finest bottle of wine, <laughs> says the woman wearing the hot couture everything waving the waitress off with a flick of her wrist. Right away, ma'am. The girl knew not to mention price to these customers. Even when the request was a nonchalant order for a $10,000 bottle of wine, the woman hadn't even asked the name of. So while we're waiting, let's talk business. Absolutely. The lawyer responds. I want... She begins, her accent twisting the sound of the first letter of the second word into more of a V sound. To take him for everything he's got. As soon as you get me his finances, we can figure out how much that will be. Ah, the investigation couldn't even get that specifically. It's gone down so much over the last few years. I should have left him years ago. 
Melania, I'm going to make sure you have everything you have on me. The waitress reappears without the bottle. Excuse me, Mr. Trump. Mrs. Trump, I'm sorry to inform you that your tab here has been canceled on account of your husband's checks bouncing and credit cards being declined. <laughs> I just have to say, you said, I immediately thought of Dracula. <laughs> when you were giving your accent, I, I love it. Um, our next story is from Elijah, and we called, we titled it The Exterminator, and Mayna is going to read that one. My associates call me The Exterminator because I always exterminate my competition out in the wild hunting games, but I've always hated it because it made me sound like a stuck-up, stubborn, and not-so-friendly person when it comes to competition. That's not true. I always try to find ways to lower that nickname by going to family restaurants, like the one I met. The feel of the cushions on the chair are exactly like pillows were uh, stapled to the base of the chair. All the waiters know I tip them a moderate amount, no matter how they act. The family, this family restaurant honestly looks a lot more fancier than typical family restaurants, like the crystal diamond chandelier hanging over every table, but I don't ever care about appearances. Sometimes I always wonder how they afforded the chandeliers with the food prices so low and how long they're going to stay in business because of it. But I'm going to enjoy it here in Tokyo and explore more of what Tokyo has to offer. Our next story is from Jerry um, and we titled it The Gerbil. Um, my ass hurts after sitting hunkered down at the same table in the back of the same dimly lit room in the same dingy dive bar along the wharf waiting for my contact to arrive. I checked my watch. It's a shiny Chinese piece of shit, but it tells the time. I watched secondhand spin. Tick, 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 tick. If I wasn't such a hard head, I'd already have given up hope. But what the hell? After having lost my last job due to a drinking problem, I have little else to do with my time. Another beer, Ringo? The bar's only waitress falls from across the room. Sure. I return as I dig around under my eye patch, hoping to stop the itch that's been dug in there ever since I lost that eye to a crazed gerbil while passed out drunk on my daughter's bedroom floor. And our next story comes from Fonza. It is titled Lunchtime. What time do you want to meet for lunch, sweetheart? We're already running late, honey, so I don't think I'll have time to make lunch. You wouldn't be running late if you just went to bed early, like I said. All right, babe, lunch it is. Time? 1.30. Place? The shrimp pot on 103rd and Temple. Thank you, honey. Love you. I love you too, sweetheart. Our next story is called, we titled it The Library, and it's by Martin. Um, and this one is a little bit different because it was an acting exercise that he wrote down for us. Um, so the, the prompt for this one was to either act as a librarian or as a customer and try to get the librarian who is hard of hearing to um, get you a book that you did not want to say the title of out loud for whatever reason. Um, so Martin wrote us two responses to this prompt, um, and both are pretty, pretty different from each other. Let's take a look at the first one. I'm an insecure 15-year-old high school sophomore with exploding singers of testosterone. I've heard about a book called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex, but I was afraid to ask, so I went to the public library to check out the book, but couldn't find it in the card catalog. My only option was to ask the hearing impaired librarian, who I did not know was hearing imp impaired. Excuse me, ma'am, I can't seem to be able to find a particular book. Can you help me, please? Young man, you have to speak up. I can't hear you. Let me closer. Do you have everything you always wanted to know about sex, but were too free to ask? And I'm, as I'm speaking into her face, I noticed to my left a girl from my class who I like very much. And she's looking at me. What? Sex? 
Yes, we carry a lot of books about sex. I turned about 15 shades of red, you know, like a house cat who ate the canary. <laughs> what a story. Let's look at the next one. I'm a 55 year old retired school teacher, Harry Impact, who took up a part time library position at the public library after retirement in order to supplement my income. Today, a young woman came in wearing dark glasses. I noticed a bit of bruising around the left side of her face, right around the lens area, suggesting that she was covering up possible domestic abuse. She was saying something to me, but because of my hearing impairment, I heard I hear about every third or fourth word or string of words. Then I'm left with the task of trying to construct a sentence from these long words. Our conversation went something like this. You books about how to poison husband. Can you speak louder? I can't hear you very well. Look, I can't behind. Well, we have books on poison, but not on husbands, I said. At that, she put her hands up like a traffic cop, stopping traffic in front. She backed away from me slowly while shaking her head. No. It was then and there that I noticed a man who had been standing by the door behind her coming toward her. He grabbed her by the arm and yanked her toward the door as if he were pulling a child away from anger. He must have him been her abuser. I feel terrible. Yeah, very different moods in both of those stories. Um, our next one is by Bobby, um, and we titled it Lorenzo Miles. Donning a $5,000 custom-made dark blue suit, tailored white shirt with diamond cufflinks, and a red silk tie, I sit in the trendiest restaurant in London trying to focus on the menu. The sturdy, heavy, dark-stained oak chair is comfortable, a statement to the sophistication that the establishment caters to. Though my occupation as a real estate mogul affords me the means to frequent such an establishment, I am by far too frugal to do so of my own volition. Nevertheless, here I am, awaiting the arrival of my most important guest, Mr. Charles Dunn of Queen City Bank. Imagine that. I, Lorenzo Miles, the kid that used to dream of building skyscrapers while playing with Legos, has ascended into that rare echelon of moguls who can command a meeting with the owner of one of the most important financial institutions in the world. Yes, success is grand. But I cannot afford to lose focus or get too cocky, for the deal is not done yet, and Mr. Dunn holds the key to the project being completed. I need him to approve the $27 million loan that I've requested so that I can finish the renovations on my Las Vegas commercial property. Is there anything I can get for you? The young redheaded waitress softly asked me. Actually, I'm still awaiting my guest, I informed her. But perhaps a vodka tonic would relax me a little? Any particular brand? No, just make it your most popular premium brand. Coming right up. She jubilantly exclaims as she walks away. Thank you, I politely say to the waitress when she delivers my drink, slipping a $20 bill into her palm as she turned to walk away. As I take a long drag from the strong drink, I savor the warmth of the liquid as it travels down my throat. I needed that, I tell myself as I reflect on the last 24 hours. When my partner on the commercial project in Las Vegas suddenly died, his wife and son decided to pull the funding that he committed to the project, I had to scramble to find a replacement, Mr. Dunn being the last call that I made. Now I find myself here, having never been to London before, sitting in this flamboyant restaurant, sweating profusely while hoping that Mr. Dunn will soon prove sagacious enough to see the value in this golden opportunity. The long flight combined with the apprehension of this meeting has me mentally exhausted. I asked the waitress, whom I've learned is named Rebecca, for another vodka tonic, grateful for its affect, yet knowing that it will 
um, regret that knowing that I will regret it in the morning. I'm really not much of a drinker. Mr. Miles, your drink. She announces upon her return. And may I introduce you to Mr. Charles Dunn? Standing, I extend my hand towards the 50-something-year-old financier and nervously go into game time mode. Mr. Dunn, Lorenzo Miles, it's my pleasure to finally meet you. Please, sit. Our next story is by Chris, um, and we titled this one, Andy Warhol and Bimple. Hey! Exclaimed Jess. Sorry, the man in the red velvet suit looked up. Are you Andy Warhol? The man grinned widely, but slightly facetiously. It was not clear whether he was happy or annoyed at the recognition. I am known by that name. Yes. Oh my God. Oh my God. Mr. Warhol, Andy, Mr. Warhol, can I shake your hand? Mm, I don't really. Jess reached out and took his hand, though. Mr. Warhol did not offer it. He daintily squeezed hers while giving the sort of bottom lip open smile that first graders give in bad school photos. I am such a big fan. I'm sure you are. I mean, the soup cans were not my thing, but your images of Marilyn Monroe? Ah, uh, yes, yes. I want to ask you so many questions. Where do you get your ideas? Well, all around me, my dear. <laughs> I, I get them from all around me. <laughs> Jess looked around, turning around. Then it dawned on her. Mr. Warhol, is that why you're in line here? For the first time since their encounter, in fact, for the first time that day, Andy Warhol smiled a verifiable smile. Why? Yes. Yes. That is why I am in line. You're in line for a balloon animal, though, made by a local clown. Uh, ah, but what better to symbolize our popular American culture? Plastic and full of air. The arts will be in letting it slowly deflate in front of the whole world. What can I get you, mister? Asked Bimple the clown. How about your choice? Said Andy. Bimple made him an animal, looking to be either a dog or a donkey. Handing it to Mr. Warhol, the balloon popped on one of his rings the moment he grabbed it. What does that symbolize? Asked Jess. Good old Andy Warhol. <laughs> Um, our final story is by Jerry, and we called this one Reincarnation, because um, the prompt for this one was to take a story that you already know, or one of your favorite characters from, from a story you know, and put them into a different setting. Um, so yeah, and Zakai is going to read this one. One of my favorite characters is Daryl from Pierce Bronze. Red Rising series. In Red Rising, humanity is divided by caste, and each caste is denoted by color. Gold represents the top of humanity, and red represents the bottom. Daryl starts as a red, but is transformed into a gold through high-tech surgery. He then, as an insider, sets out to free all the lower colors from gold's tyranny and shackles. It is a typical hero's journey with several psychics and a mentor, Daryl is strong and brave and handsome, but he lacks confidence and is secret to death, scared to death. He will be, he will be find, uh, found out. I'd like to transfer him into a story set in the 15th century and make him a sea captain leading a ship full of pirates, kind of like the movie Pirates of the Caribbean, only he'd be the exact opposite of Captain Jack Sparrow. In his new story, He'd still be fighting against the power that be. Only those powers would be the English and Spanish royal families. Um, and that wraps up all of our all of our create props and stories. Um, so the last thing that we wanted to share with you um, 
each week we have a rosebud and thorn section in our packets. Um, so we kind of collected some of our favorite roses, um, which is like a good thing that happened that week or something they're looking forward to. Um, and we collected all of our favorite ones and we're gonna share some of those with you. Um, yeah. So first from Fonza, we have, I have taken the Moderna vaccine and I finally feel safe. Um, our next uh, memory from Fonza from this semester is, I've reconnected with my niece. It's been 17 years since I've talked to her. I'm so happy to witness how much she has grown into a lovely young lady. And the next we want to share is counting down the days before I am resentenced. Yeah. Um, and then next we have um, from Jerry. I can read mine first. Um, <laughs> I train service dogs here at the facility, and since I contracted COVID back in March of last year, I haven't had a dog, but we were recently told the dogs should be returning soon. I am so looking forward to this. My dogs mean so much to me in here. They are my best friends. Um, our next uh, thing shared from Jerry was, it snowed. I love the snow. I love being buried under the weight of several heavy blankets and one thick, heavy quilt. The snow reminds me of that feeling. And the final one, while standing in my cell with my eyes closed and a book balanced atop, of, uh, atop my head, several of my friends found out and kept peeking in. The good news is that they're used to me doing weird shit like this. So when they joke with me about it later, it was all good natured. I laughed several times over that today. Um, and next we have some from Chris. Um, so our first one is that he's looking forward to my father safely returning from his vacation and COVID free. COVID free. Um, so there's an outbreak when he was vacationing. Um, our next uh, memory from Chris is a friend gave me his oatmeal cookie just as a nice gesture today. Kindness makes a big difference sometimes. And last but not least, I heard from an old friend of mine. And next we have Elijah. Um, Elijah says, I got my third and final stimulus check and I'm feeling extremely blessed. Next from Elijah. He said, my mother has ordered two books that I'm extremely interested in reading. And he also shared with, her, with us, I finally managed to find a stamped envelope to send this to you guys. Really appreciate that. Um, next up is Martin. Um, I found out that my oldest granddaughter, Isabel, or Izzy, went into labor on January 22nd. Found out that my first great grandchild, Diana, has arrived. Uh, our next um, uh, memory from Martin is, uh, he said, I was blessed to be able to talk with my granddaughter, Aaliyah Jade, uh, for her birthday. I just received a stimulus payment and have had my oldest daughter open up a stock account. I'm looking forward to being able to help manage the account. Uh, with the help of God, so I can leave some sort of legacy to my family. And we also have Marty sharing. My daughter, Elisha, Elisha, sent me some digital photos. One was of her and her husband, Mark, with their 19-year-old son. Another was one of all four of my kids, together when my oldest son, Ben, and his family came to Michigan to visit. It was nice to see how um, they aged gracefully during the COVID lockdowns. Another was a black and white print of my mom and dad holding me as a little baby. That was priceless. I had never seen that photo before. Then our last ones are from Bobby. Um, and Bobby says that he's looking forward to the NFL playoffs. And um, next from Bobby, he, he said that this week, I experienced happiness when I received communication with someone who I haven't heard from in a few months. This happiness was amplified when they revealed to me that they contracted COVID, but completely recovered. 
And Bobby also shared that he in he genuinely enjoyed talking to his mother. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much everything. Um, I have had so much fun working on these packets and reading all of the responses we've gotten to them. Um, everyone in this workshop are such gifted writers and creators and put so much life into the words that you write to us, um, which I really appreciate. And I feel like I've really been able to get to know more about all of you throughout these past few months. Um, so thank you for participating in this workshop and sharing your stories with all of us. Yeah, um, I also wanted to say thank you all for um, sharing your work with us in the past few months. It's genuinely been a privilege to have uh, the opportunity to hear your voices through the writings that you send. Um, and I wish we could all be together in person. And I know um, all of us hope that one day we might meet in future workshops. Um, for me personally, uh, I intend to volunteer for music workshops in the future. For those of you who are musically inclined, and I know there are several. Um, and I genuinely hope you're all proud of the work you've done, what you've created, and know that um, reading your perspectives and feelings and creative stories throughout this workshop has impacted um, my own outlook and how I want to move forward um, creatively in the future. Thank you all again. And I would just like to appreciate my fellow participants as well as my fellow facilitators. So as someone who spent my freshman year online completely in Zoom University, so um, I think receiving and reading all those responses is actually one of the main reasons I'm surviving this unbearable Zoom University. <laughs> so I really, really cherish such connection that transcends the boundary of prison bars and even national boundaries. So thank you all for being a part of the great journey that truly added my understanding for building community. So it is about connecting different social groups through meaningful conversations and thereby te tearing down the intergroup boundaries. In the context of this particular PCAP workshop, it means equal and sincere engagement, which allows your creativity to shine. And for the outsider like me to appreciate the humanity that shines in each one of you. So thank you very much. It was, it has been a great journey. Thank yeah, you. Um, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah uh, we hope that we'll be able to send some kind of response to you all in the future, despite the semester ending, because we're still receiving your packets and we still love um, hearing your responses. I think that's it. Stop.